Yeah. All right, so for the, uh, the first talk of the afternoon session, we're very happy to have uh, Juan Magasena uh, to talk uh, to us. And uh, as I understand it, he's also going to hand off to Ahmed right. to Al-Marie. Okay, point very good. Talk. Yeah. So this, uh, this subject that we'll discuss today uh, is based basically on two papers that came out last spring, one by Pennington and the other one by Almeri Engelhardt, Maroff, and Maxfield. And I here highlighted Almeri because he's here, but not only because of that, but he will give the second part of this talk. Um, okay, so um, I will start this talk very generally. So very general remarks that probably are known to most people, but I, I think I will still say them. Um, so first, uh, we'll mention what the a central dogma, okay? Central, central dogma of black hole studies and so on. Um, and it consists of the following, that if you have a black hole and you look at the black hole from the outside, so black hole uh, from outside uh, is equal to a quantum mechanical system with uh, e to the s with s qubits. Okay? Very good. So this, uh, and well there are lots of evidences for this, uh, let's say the black hole entropy in string theory works, uh, let's say the SCFT and so on. Um, but uh, you can uh, take it as an article of faith for this talk, or, and we'll discuss evidence for, for this. Um, now, this central dogma does not say anything about the interior, okay? So it's only a statement about the exterior, and most of the checks and things that uh, have been discussed over the I don't know, last uh, 20, 30 years were about the exterior, okay? And the interesting new developments is that we are understanding some more aspects, more aspects about the interior. So this talk will be more about the interior of the black hole. Um, and we, what we would like to do is make some statements uh, about the interior. So in particular, one question that uh, one could ask is, uh, this quantum system, does it describe the interior of the black hole or not? Okay. This is uh, one question we would like to ask. And just as a spoiler, I would just say that sometimes yes and sometimes no. Okay? And we'll try to understand when it is yes and when the answer is yes and when the answer is no. Um, now, one central tool in the study of this type of question is uh, black hole entropy. Okay? Um, So you know the formula for black hole entropy, everyone? W what is the formula for black hole entropy? Any candidates? Okay, that, that's good. Um, okay, now which area? Event horizon, good, good. Is this a complete formula or is there something missing? What? Well, other horizons, so maybe it's area of other, other. So now we have more candidates. So, but even for this, this formula, for a black hole in thermal equilibrium, is there anything missing? Fields outside, stuff. Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. S, um, S matter. So we could have the black hole um, surrounded by stuff, and we cannot, we cannot really separate it from the stuff that's around. So it's the, this, this system is describing everything that is outside. We are describing the black hole from the outside, and this is the entropy. So S matter, or let me call it SQFT, because this part includes also the quantum uh, fields. So the quantum vacuum has some contribution to the entropy and it's included there. So the fact that there is Hawking radiation and there is um, the mixed state for the vacuum outside the black hole is relevant and contributes to the entropy and is included here. There is of course diversion pieces that cancel and so on, 
but we should include this. Okay, now, what kind of entropy is this? So, um, um, okay, I'll give you two options. One is, uh, it is uh, trace raw log raw of the uh, density of the, the density matrix that describes the black hole. Uh, so that's option number one. And option number two is that it is the thermodynamic entropy. Um, so first of all, we, we should discuss the difference between these two notions of entropy. So rho is, would be the entropy of the uh, quantum system, the full entropy of the quantum system, if we are allowed to do arbitrarily complicated measurements. Okay? So we can do arbitrarily complicated measurements, we do whatever we want, we evolve the system forwards in time, backwards in time, that's considered easy, and any, any other thing we can do from the outside. We determine the density matrix and then we compute this. So that's the, uh, what's called the fine grain entropy. Um, and then the thermodynamic entropy is something different. So the thermodynamic entropy is, well, I'm going to measure a few things. So a few, let's say, easy things. And then I'm going to consider the density matrix that agrees with uh, all those easy things, but has the maximal possible entropy of this kind. Trace raw log row is maximal. And that's the thermodynamic entropy. Now, this formula, which of the two entropies does it compute? Well, there is a hint, so. Um, are you not answering because you know the answer? Or because you know the, answer? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is too obvious? <laughs> um, this, this entropy obeys the second law, right? So the, if, if the system evolves under unitary evolution, um, this entropy, this area of the horizon could increase. For example, when a star forms, uh, when a star forms a black hole, the, uh, this entropy increases. First there is no horizon and then there is some horizon, so the, the, this entropy increases. Now this kind of entropy cannot increase under unitary time evolution. So this time of, type of entropy should be constant, so it cannot be this one. But the thermodynamic entropy can be, so this is the thermodynamic entropy of a black hole. Okay. Now the, prog the progress in the, in the last few years has been that there is a second black hole entropy which is a other plus some SQFT. And there is some other surface here that gives us this entropy of the black hole. Okay. Um, so what is this other surface? Um, any candidates? No? <coughs> ne never heard about this formula? <laughs> okay. Um, this is the so-called Ruta Kanagi formula, but uh, it might be that uh, you've heard it in a different context. But um, so now, it, does it sound more familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, in order to determine this other surface and uh, their vision outside, what we do is um, that uh, really what we do is we do a, a minimization of an extremization over all possible surfaces, A, so A plus SQFT over 4G Newton. So we consider a formula which is similar to this one, but we vary the surface. We, it's not the horizon, but it's any surface that we can choose, any, any surface we can move it in time or whatever. And we compute the, this generalized entropy looking uh, formula with area plus entropy of the fields outside. And then we find the extremum. And if there is more than one extremum, we find the minimal, the one that has the minimal value of all the extrema, right? And that uh, gives us uh, this entropy. And this entropy is supposed to compute the trace log row of the system, okay? So this is the uh, fine-grained entropy. Now, this entropy has been discussed a lot in the context of ADS-CFT as entropy of subregions and so on. Um, and it's fine, and you can view uh, that as a particular case of this, or this as a particular case of that other discussion. Um, but this is just some entropy you can define in gravity. You don't need ADS-CFT, you don't need uh, any, um, it's not tied to ADS, it's just tied to, you need to be able to look at the black hole from the outside, and it's a property 
of uh, the entropy of this quantum system, this hypothetical quantum system that is supposed to describe the black hole. Okay? I mean, we think that the fact that the black hole can be described as a quantum system is a property of gravity. So it should be just the property of gravity, and from gravity we should in principle describe, de define this quantum system. Um, now, none, none of these two entropies tell us what the microstates are and what this, uh, this system of finite qubits is, etc. Et they just tell us what the entropy is. Okay? Um, good. So, just now review a couple of examples that have been discussed here uh, where this entropy has been computed. So, we're going to look at the black hole. So, that's the same picture of the black hole, but the space time picture of, uh, let's say, a black hole that was formed from collapse. So that's, uh, um, we have the matter that uh, formed the black hole. Uh, that's the horizon. We could be asymptotically ADS or asymptotically flat. It doesn't matter. Um, and then, uh, in order to define this, we need a uh, few things. So we need to say, well, we are looking at the black hole, and how much do we include? Well, we can say, well, we, we define some cutoff surface, let's say some place uh, far away from the black hole where we can neglect the effects of gravity. So I'm going to draw the cutoff surface here somewhere. So that's uh, the cutoff surface. Um, and then I'm going to decide, we are going to decide at some point in time, let's say at this point in time, uh, we decide to uh, calculate uh, this entropy. And so what we are supposed to do is we are supposed to draw a spatial slice somewhere. And then find here the minimal area surface. So here the minimal area surface would be here. And then we could vary, uh, so in this particular case it's zero, but we could in principle vary this slice and find uh, also the extremal surface choosing by choosing different slices. So in this case, um, uh, we get a slice like this. Uh, and uh, there is an associated region called the entanglement wedge, which is uh, the um, domain of dependence of this slice, so everything that can be determined if you know what's going on on this slice. Okay? And the idea is that um, the quantum system that we are discussing, so which is this quantum system of the black hole as seen from the outside, describes everything that is contained within this entanglement wedge. So, that, well, that, Douglas mentioned that in his talk, uh, but that's the uh, idea of entanglement wedge reconstruction. So more technically, the statement is that if you have the state of an unknown probe qubit uh, here in the interior, um, you can uh, figure out what um, the state of that qubit is uh, by doing operations uh, purely uh, from the outside or on the quantum system. Uh, and Douglas described how, to, how one would do that. Okay, so now uh, we could consider also uh, the same problem at a later time. And at a later time, we would, uh, okay, so maybe there's one more thing I need to say here, is that uh, the area was zero, but the entropy of the quantum fields uh, was non-zero. So that was the entropy of the star, right? So the original entropy is the entropy of the star. If we now compute the same thing at a later time, so we'll get a slightly different entanglement wedge. And um, the entropy, uh, again, the area is zero, and the entropy continues to be the entropy of the star, right? Because we unitarily evolve the star from here to there, continue to have the same entropy. The thermodynamic entropy is different. So here, we had a thermodynamic entropy, which, let's say, was the entropy of the star. But at this point, uh, it was uh, given by the area of this horizon, which is much bigger. So the entropy, the first entropy grows, the, this one remains constant, okay? And we can check that it remains constant. So this is a simple check that this uh, proposal for the entropy uh, makes some sense. And there are many other consistency checks of this uh, formula, of course. Um, so now uh, there is a second black hole that we'll discuss. Uh, that's the eternal black hole. So we have um, a run out of space here. Um, OK, so that's the eternal black hole. And we look at the eternal black hole from this side. And uh, there might be some singularities here. It could be space-like, time-like, uh, depending on whether it's charged or not. Um, and in this case, the, um, we might uh, have our cutoff surface. Um, oh, well, the stock would be disorganized. <laughs> OK, so we have our cutoff surface. And at uh, some time, uh, we, we decide to look at the minimal areas. And the minimal area here would be here. Um, and in this case, well, again, we get some entanglement wedge and so on. And uh, in this case, the, um, 
the area, actually, the, this fine grain entropy is actually equal to the area at this point. Okay? So that's, um, that's what we get from this diagram. Okay, now, um, very good. And all of these are things that we do on the gravity side. Um, now, how did, let, let's ask, now I would like to, uh, since this formula is playing uh, such an important role, I would like to just review the derivation of these formulas. Okay? Um, the, how, how you derive these formulas and the, the, the more modern uh, observations and so on can also be derived uh, in the same way, so there, it's with a minor twist. Um, so, a, a derivation of uh, the black hole entropy, especially uh, in this context of the black hole in thermal equilibrium, uh, was the Gibbons-Hawking calculation, where uh, they said, well, we consider the Euclidean black hole, and we think of uh, the Euclidean black hole as computing uh, the trace of uh, e to the minus beta h, where this is supposed to be some trace in the full Hilbert space of the theory of the quantum gravity theory, and we are assuming um, we are assuming there is a set of states we are summing over. We don't know exactly what those states are, um, but the computation we do in gravity uh, fixes the boundary, the region outside the black hole to have a thermal circle, and then we fill it in in a smooth way, and uh, computing this action we get the uh, the value of this sum. Okay? Yeah, there was a question? No? Okay, I thought there was a question. Okay. Um, now, re relatedly, we can think of this as, so if we, we cut open this, um, this path integral, um, we can think of this as a computation of a density matrix, um, rho, okay? Um, and this is, uh, we can think of this as the computation of trace of rho. So trace of rho, this is an unnormalized density matrix. And uh, this would be equal to e to the minus the gravitational action. And then we could even compute this to further orders if we wanted, uh, including the determinants over quantum fields. So we could have the quantum field contribution would be an additional factor here. Okay. Um, very good. OK. Now, uh, in this thermal equilibrium case, uh, these two entropies are actually the same, and we, this could be viewed as a derivation of any, any of these two entropies. Okay. Now let's go a little bit away from thermal equilibrium, and one way we can go away from thermal equilibrium is by modifying this partition, this computation, so we can add a little wiggle to, uh, to, this, uh, to this circle. Now what does it mean to add the wiggle? So what it means is that um, we change the boundary, so here the fi every, every field has some boundary conditions on this circle, let's say they're equal to zero, and let's say for some field we change the boundary conditions in this region, okay? And what this will do is it will uh, introduce some matter, some additional matter, let's say some matter fields in this geometry. So, um, so this will be now not a black hole in thermal equilibrium, but a black hole that's been perturbed, and um, will have a different uh, Penrose diagram, so Penrose diagram that uh, will look uh, a little more elongated. So there will be uh, basically uh, a Penrose diagram roughly of this form with some extra matter here in the middle and um, maybe some matter goes out also. And so in this situation, the area of the horizon here and here will be different and the minimal area surface will also be somewhere else. So it might be there, okay, for example. Okay, so that's the Lorentzian picture uh, that such, such a perturbation would, ex would do. Um, and we can uh, either cut here, we can put the wiggle anywhere we want. Uh, we could cut here and think of this as two uh, black holes as we have over there. Um, and uh, if we are looking at the right black hole, we can also think of this as preparing the density matrix for computing the density matrix for that configuration where we trace out the left side. Um, Okay, so now if we wanted to compute uh, this entropy, there is a well-known uh, trick that consists of uh, computing uh, rho to the n. Well, let me first uh, discuss something simpler. So if we have the thermal, in the thermal equilibrium case, 
there is a formula for the entropy, the usual thermodynamical formula for the entropy, uh, that says that this is the same as the log of the partition function. Right? So you take the log of the partition function, um, you calculate uh, this quantity, and that gives us the entropy. Okay? Now there is a similar formula for an arbitrary density matrix that says that this is 1 minus n the n of uh, some log of some set n, and this uh, set n is just simply trace of uh, rho to the n. Okay? So if we take trace of rho to the n, and we analytically continue in n, uh, and then set n equal to 1, uh, then we uh, compute the entropy. Okay. Now, um, so... Now in computing this, uh, so the, the nice thing is that the computation of trace of rho to the n, uh, if n is an integer, uh, reduces to uh, a simple geometric computation where the boundary loop here is completely closed, uh, but it will consist of a situation where we have a bunch of uh, little wiggles, let's say. And so, um, so here we have uh, boundary conditions which are invariant under set 3, so they should be, well, this doesn't look invariant, but that's by... Uh, well, okay, you can make it invariant in your mind by applying the appropriate uh, conformal transformation. Um, so there is a set three symmetry. Um, um, so in this particular case, the, uh, the well, the boundary conditions will always be C3 symmetric, but it might be that you, uh, when you fill it in, you might or might not break the C3 symmetry, but there might be different ways of filling this in, okay? And we are going to consider mainly uh, the situation where, when we fill it in, we continue to preserve the C3 symmetry. Um, yeah, by the way, this, this issue of filling the manifold in, it's uh, in different ways, is also, of course, present in the, um, in the standard thermal uh, discussion. So, in just the standard uh, black hole discussion, we normally, the, okay, this is the problem with white words. Um, so we have a circle, um, we have an S2, um, and in this geometry the circle shrinks to zero, but the S2 does not shrink to zero, right? This is roughly a picture of uh, the topology of the usual black hole solution. But there is the topology of just uh, flat space with, or flat space with a circle, uh, thermal, so circle ident thermal direction identified, where the S2 shrinks to zero at the origin, uh, but the S1 does never shrink to zero. Now, depending on the situation, either this one or that one can dominate. Uh, it's uh, familiar to probably most of you that in ADS uh, there is a transition between this and that uh, way of filling the geometry. So one, one is DS1 and the other is DS2. Um, and uh, that's called the Hawking page transition. Okay, Hawking, Hawking page transition. Um, and as you can have Hawking page transitions for, so what it will, you'll see that it's important that these transitions uh, can happen, that you, these different ways of filling it in can happen also when we are computing this other entropy. I mean, it's not very surprising if it already happens for a circle when you have a more complicated contour, it will also happen. Okay, okay now comes the fi finding the right pages. Okay, well, anyway, I won't look at the pages. <laughs> um, um, okay, so now um, I would like to go from uh, these pictures to uh, the formula for this formula of Ryu and Takayanagi. Okay, so this is some, we're just reviewing here some papers that uh, we wrote with Lekowitz and then also Faulkner and also Dong and Lekowitz wrote uh, the, the paper that I'm going, the description, I'm, basically the description I'm going to discuss now. Um, which includes the matter. So we are computing, we are going to be interested in looking at geometries of this kind with n copies. And the goal is to uh, go to n equal to 1 to apply the formula that I just erased. Okay? The n equal to 1. Um, do you want to see this derivation? or? Yes. Yes? Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Well. It wasn't planned. It wasn't, I didn't, we did plan the talk, but not this particular way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we said that log of set n um, 
is equal to minus the gravitational action of the nth copies. Um, so this is a manifold uh, mn. I, I'm only drawing the n equal to 3 case here. Uh, plus the log of uh, set matter, okay? So this is the matter partition function, so the quantum fields. And this is the action of some manifold mn, okay? So the first step is to uh, say that instead of considering, yeah, what, what the goal here is to do the analytic continuation in n. This is not so trivial because um, we had here like three copies, right? It's, it's hard to analytically continue uh, in the set of boundary conditions. I mean, the, either, yeah. Uh, it's hard to say what it is, let's say, to have half a wiggle or pieth of a wiggle. Um, so the first step is to uh, instead consider a different problem where we um, consider the manifold uh, divided by set n. And this part is the classical gravitational action. And the gravitational action is an integral of something over this geometry. And it's n times the integral over a little wedge. So we consider, so one now, one of these wedges is the manifold um, I'm calling m over set n. And the gravitational part is just n times uh, what it was for this case. The matter part is the same. So then log c matter. OK, good. Now this, uh, what does this look like? So this looks like um, we had the original sort of contour that we had before. Uh, and instead of having the smooth feeling that we had in the uh, n equal to 1 case, we have here uh, 2 pi over n uh, opening angle. Okay? So we have a conical singularity. In this, this manifold has a conical singularity. Of course, the original manifold does not have any conical singularity, so the conical singularity is not really physical. It's just uh, an, ar an artifact of the description. Uh, but the advantage of this is that this boundary condition is now n-independent. So now, as we go to different ends, all that happens here is that this opening angle changes. And well, we could consider a manifold with a fractional opening angle, so that's uh, not a big deal, okay? So that's, uh, that's easy. And this C matter, you can also think of this as matter uh, that propagates on this manifold, on n copies of this manifold. So we, now we have n copies of this manifold. And here we have the insertion of a twist field tau n, that, so that when you go around, uh, this, uh, there is a kind of, this, this twist field creates a kind of branch cut. And when you go around this branch cut, you exchange from one copy to the next and so on. Okay? Um, good. So now, um, um, yeah, maybe I'll have to erase this one. Uh, so what we have, let me draw it here. We had this conical uh, little thing. Um, so now we'll, um, we'll apply the, the formula of, um, well, let me not apply it yet. So we will take this. And this consists of an integral of square root of gr uh, over uh, this manifold. But we are not including a delta function. So you, you can wonder whether we should or should not include here a delta function singularity at this curve, right? But the, in the original manifold, there was no delta function. It was, was fine. So we, we should not include a delta function here. So this is this, but no delta function, no delta, OK? But you can write it. You can write the same thing as the integral of square root of gr, where you do include the delta function. But then at the same time, you subtract that delta function. Um, um, the integral over uh, the co-dimension two surface of square root of g. Okay? So this is an integral over the whole manifold. And this is an integral over the co-dimension two of the rest of the dimensions at this point. Okay? All this is doing is subtracting the same thing that we added. But now uh, this looks like uh, the action for a cosmic brain or a cosmic string. So in four dimensions, it would be a cosmic string, but in general, let's say cosmic brain, co dimension two surface. Uh, that creates an opening angle, which is 2 pi over n, okay? With a tension, so this is some tension, and this tension is creating this opening angle. Okay, good. Um, now, when we apply, so when, when, we, when we apply the formula, um, for the entropy, uh, one minus n dn uh, log of uh, log of log of set. Okay, this right hand side. Um, okay, when we uh, act on this, uh, this n uh, pulls out and cancels this one. So uh, we'll now have 
the minus n dn of the gravitational action of this form, so I gravity on this manifold mn over set n with the cosmic brain inserted. Um, and we are interested in co computing this for n close to 1. And the matter part, um, when we do uh, that for the matter part, um, for the matter part, uh, when we take the n close to 1 limit, uh, we'll end up doing the computation uh, that we normally would do to compute the entropy of matter, right? So this matter part will just uh, give the S uh, matter, okay? And um, in this part, um, so there is, we, when we have the original metric at n equal to 1, we are going to change that metric to a metric near n equal to 1. And, um, um, and there will be a change of that metric from this term, but given that the n equal to 1 solution is a solution, this term cancels. Okay? And so we'll only have uh, the, this goes to 0 when n goes to 1, so we'll only have this term and we'll get the area term. Right? So this will give us the area plus uh, the S matter. Now, um, th this, um, this is, hasn't given us the minimization uh, yet, so to, to get the minim minimization condition, it's better to think that um, before we solve the equations, we take the n close to 1 limit. Okay? So we are at n close to 1, and when n is close to 1, so we have some n minus 1, so we consider slightly off-shell geometries as, as we are trying to find in the classical geometry. Um, and so we have an n minus 1 multiplying this whole thing. And when we vary the, the geometry to a general off-shell geometry, in this term, uh, that will vanish. Uh, and in this term, here we put the background n equal to 1 geometry, and, but we consider an arbitrary surface. Okay? So, um, so we can do that. Um, and then, uh, of course, we'll get the S matter. And now, just the equations of motion that we have will simply extremize uh, this quantity. Okay? So first extremizing and then taking the n equal to 1 is essentially the same as uh, first taking n close to 1 and then extremizing. And when you extremize, it turns out that the only thing you need to extremize is the area plus, S, plus the entropy. The, the, the miracle that you don't need to extremize over the rest of the geometry came from the fact that the n equal to 1 solution, configuration was a solution. Okay. Um, okay, so this, uh, this is basically what was in the, uh, some version of this was in the Dong Lykowitz uh, paper. Good, so this uh, derived this formula. Uh, and, yeah. Is this different than what Callan and Milchak and Tuscan and Oswald were doing in the early 90s? Or is it? Uh, the geometric entropy discussion? Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, it is different. So the, 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 the geometric entropy, the, the, that, those discussions, um, had to do with the computation of S matter, okay? So the, when you compute S matter, you do again this replica trick, but uh, the geometry has no back reaction. So you take the original black hole geometry and you do these quotients, and uh, take n equal to 1, you get uh, the a matter contribution. So you're saying they didn't get the tree-level term? Yeah, they didn't, they didn't get the tree-level terms. It, it's true that Saskin and Oglum were talking about this three-level thing, and that was done originally, well, something similar to this was done by Hawking and, um, and um, Gibbons, right? Yeah. That uh, argued that the entropy came only from the fixed points. Uh, had the strings cut well, there was the issue of the business of strings, but this is orthogonal. This is, th right. there is no strings in this discussion. Um, so the, the fact that this has, the, the fact that when you compute the entropy, you get the area was already in the, uh, gibbons Hawking discussion, the, the new thing here is the fact that you are doing this for more general geometries and therefore you have to find the actual solution and that involves a minimization of this quantity or an extremization of this quantity. So that's the new idea. And you, you could say that's just the only new idea. Okay, so that's the... Uh, yes, this is order 1 over g newton and this is naively, this is a correction and yeah, indeed, you could worry that uh, maybe we should also include other corrections. And in principle, yes, we should include other corrections. And so this formula is only true to this order. But we'll see that there are interesting uh, situations where you, we can actually find the balance between these two things. Um, 
And the reason you, you can stop here and not worry about further corrections, um, well, it's, uh, it, it's really a twofold reason. One is that there are some situations where this area term is particularly small, like near black hole horizons and so on. And also that uh, we also have the, so that we, we have to extremize this and also minimize when there are different solutions. And when you are minimizing over different solutions, the, the two extrema or near extremal situations, maybe there might be further corrections and so on, can look very different. And, um, and so when you do this minimization, you are choosing between two things that are very different. And that's what was uh, crucial in these discussions. Um, well, especially in the page curve discussion. Uh, okay, um, very good. Um, okay, I think I'm done with that. So, um, so that's uh, essentially the derivation of this uh, RT formula. That's, as I said, it's not too different from the Gibbons-Hawking derivation. It's just uh, the only new thing is that uh, you need to extremize this area and came from these more complicated boundary conditions. Um, and also when you include matter, this minimization includes also the, the matter contribution. Um, so in the, in the original papers that talked about this, uh, I think the, the matter contribution was always thought as to be a small correction. I mean, one of the main innovations, uh, well, the main innovation in these papers is to notice that there was a situation where including the matter really led to new surfaces. Yeah. Good. So th this is a for this is a formula. Um, so this formula is uh, this derivation of this formula is valid in situations where um, we you can use the classical gravity equations and with a CN symmet where the solution has a CN symmetry. If that doesn't happen, this formula doesn't apply, and you are back to the board, and you have to figure out how to do it. Right. Um, notice that. In the formula, we were using essentially classical gravity equations. And this minimization is also related to imposing classical gravity equations. Okay. Now, there are situations and, uh, where maybe uh, there are many manifolds that contribute, and they all contribute equally. And a nice example was given in a paper by uh, the St Douglas Stanford and collaborators, um, one part of which uh, Douglas uh, explained recently. But in that same paper, uh, they discuss a situation where there are many manifolds contributing, and they just sum over all the manifolds in this simple uh, model of JT gravity. And, um, and well, then uh, you, you don't need to worry about this. So you just sum over all the manifolds, and you get something. In that case, it's not that there is a solution that breaks the replica symmetry, but you sum over manifolds. Uh, many of them do not have a CN symmetry, uh, and you get, uh, you get some answer. But... Um, I don't know if there is a discussion of uh, situations where there is a classical solution that breaks the replica symmetry that is relevant. Um, so may maybe there is such a thing, and w whether it's useful for anything, I don't know. So the words replica symmetry are important for spin, spin glasses. Um, and there is a similar story where you put replicas and take n equal to zero instead of n equal to one. And there it's important to consider replica symmetric solu uh, breaking solutions. Um, but yeah, and it would be interesting to see whether any of that plays any role whatsoever here. But as far as I know, there was no paper on this. Um, okay. Um, now, okay, you can't look at these papers anymore. Um, Actually, can I ask why you call these solutions with the connected wormholes got symmetry breaking solutions? Is the answer natural solutions? No, the, these solutions are not, these are replica preserving solutions, right. replica symmetry preserving solutions. Yeah, I have not talked about replica breaking solutions. People you often ask this because in the field of spin glasses, replica breaking is very important. And here, it has not been important so far. That's, uh, so ignore replica. Well, not, not, I shouldn't say ignore. They have been ignored by previous people who had worked on it. Maybe they are relevant for some. <laughs> um, OK, now, uh, how do we apply this to black holes? So we have. Uh, a black hole, so we had this uh, black hole that was formed from a star, but uh, it's now evaporating, right? So we have uh, the black hole is evaporating, and uh, so I'm now going to review those papers. So the black hole evaporates, and uh, you emit Hawking radiation. And now Hawking radiation, 
So we had our cutoff surface here, um, sort of um, leaves the cutoff surface, and um, it can lead. So let's say the initial star that formed the black hole had zero entropy, um, and uh, so now when we compute the entanglement entropy at this point, uh, this mode has left, and now this mode contributes to the entropy, the one that is inside. Um, now these two modes have left, and now there are two modes that contribute to the entropy, and so on. And as we go forwards in time, there are more and more modes that contribute to the entropy. Okay? So we have, if we were to compute the entropy of the black hole, um, so this would be uh, the fine grain entropy of the black hole. Okay? Um, it would uh, follow, it would rise, right? Um, don't, maybe the rise is not a straight line, but it will rise. And by the end, when the black hole comp evaporates completely, uh, the, it looks like, uh, well, there will be a bunch of radiation that uh, was emitted. There are all the partners inside. And if you uh, consider the entropy of all the partners inside, it's, of course, equal to the entropy of all the Hawking modes. And it will reach uh, some maximum. And after that, it uh, will remain constant. Right? So after that, if we uh, compute the entropy at the surface, we will get uh, constant that will come from uh, the entropy on these slices. Okay, now um, on the other hand we had the, the entropy of the black hole, the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole, which was uh, the initial area of the horizon, let's say just after it formed. And that entropy of the black hole, as the black hole is evaporating, is uh, decreasing somehow, it's probably some decreasing curve. Okay. Um, and so at some point, the entropy of the fine grain entropy seems to be bigger than the coarse grain entropy, right? And this, this uh, cannot be the case, right? So the thermodynamic entropy is by definition defined as the maximum. It could be given some constraints, and it, so it cannot, there cannot be an example that uh, is bigger than that. So we reach a contradiction here, okay? Now this, this curve is the curve that uh, Hawking would make, right? So that's the curve calculated by Hawking. And um, it's a well-defined calculation. You can calculate it far away. And I remember Andy uh, challenged uh, all of the community to figure out how to get this curve from a gravity computation. Right? Um, OK. Now, um, and no notice that here, when we compute um, this entropy, we could be either computing the entropy of the black hole or the entropy of the radiation, and we are getting the same answer in both cases. Okay, so we could view this. No, Page did not get it from the gravity computation. No, no. The, 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 okay, there is the page curve, which is which says that you should go up here, and then go down, right? Um, and. Um, this is what you expect. This is what you expect if the central dogma was correct. But Hawking said the central dogma is incorrect. Okay? So and he did a computation and got this answer. So we have to say what is wrong with this answer. Okay? Um, so what, uh, what those papers there have said, I mean, friends, they said, well, when you compute the, uh, the entropy at this point, well, there is a huge entropy here. And it actually turns out that there is a second RT surface somewhere here, um, where you use a balance between the entanglement and, uh, of the quantum fields outside and the area. And the entanglement wedge is there for something smaller here. Um, this is the entanglement wedge of the black hole. And the entanglement wedge of the radiation, the idea is that it is the complement of that. OK, so it's this thing. And so now, uh, all these modes that are inside the black hole should be viewed as uh, contributing uh, when you do the computation of the entanglement with, of the radiation. Well, there are two points here. Let me try not to mix them. First is, if you compute the entropy of the black hole, it will be, big, be given essentially by the area of the black hole here at this point, at some late, late point. Um, so there is a second RT surface, which uh, will have an entropy which is uh, close to the entropy of the, um, close to the black hole entropy, right? So there is a second curve here, maybe I should draw it in black also. So it's a fine grain entropy. 
So this other fine candidate for the fine grain entropy is uh, some curve like this, right? But uh, the true fine grain entropy should be the minimal of the two. So at this point, it should, this is the minimum. But at this point, this is the minimum, right? So we, we always we, we have these two choices. Late, just uh, late enough, basically not too late, but maybe a scrambling time after the black hole has formed. We have also this other uh, possibility. But um, it only becomes important when it can compete uh, against the other, OK? So the, the, it's a bit like this. Uh, it's like a Hawking page transition. So you have two, well, maybe I should clarify this a little more. Um, computing either one solution versus the other curve come from different geometric configurations in the replica manifold. So in this manifold where we have all these replicas, we have different geometries. Um, I think Ahmed will discuss in more detail one particular example um, where you can see clearly what the difference is. And in the, um, so there are two uh, replica manifold geometries and one contributes most uh, at this, in this region and gives the Hawking answer. And the other one contributes most in this other region and gives uh, the page-like curve. And so we have this transition between the Hawking and page curve is like a Hawking page transition of those, uh, those geometries. And so here, here uh, what they showed is that uh, here you get this page curve from uh, doing a gravity computation, doing a computation using this gravitational formula for the fine grain entropy. No idea CFT was involved here. It was all uh, computed using gravity, right? The same uh, methods we computed the entropy of gravity, well, the Gibbons Hawking entropy and so on. Okay. Um, let's see, I think I'll just uh, leave this now to Ahmed. Um, I, yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe, well, good, well, yeah. Can I ask some questions while I uh, yeah. some references? Yeah. Questions? Yeah, Andy. Well, time could be the time on this cut of surface, for example. So it's the time at which you are computing the fine grain entropy. Yeah, it could, it could be it could be at sky plus if you wanted, but uh, right? right. there would be different. You well, you'll have you'll have to do the. It's easiest to discuss this computation when the when you put a cut of surface at some finite distance. But I think it, I, I think you could also probably put it at uh, sky plus. So, will it be exact? Um, no, I think it would be basically the same. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think th this is a, this is a computation of the entropy, and um, you indeed resolve the question of the entropy. But there are other questions you do not resolve. So, for example, an explicit description of the microstates, uh, an explicit uh, the form for the density matrix. What one is understanding is that the density matrix, whatever it is, once you compute its trace row log row, uh, will give you this. So the, the, the questions you have here are the same questions you had with the Gibbons Hawking entropy that you, um, or, or the, black, the original black hole entropy. You don't know what the microstates are. You like to have a count of microstates, for example, in that problem. Here, again, you like to have the dynamics of those microstates. And how to get those from gravity is what we would like to understand. Okay, um, let me first begin by thanking the organizers for inviting Juan, who asked me to speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is part two of Juan's talk, uh, putting some, some, so some meat on the last comments that uh, Juan made. Um, so Juan was, uh, or, or analyzed the problem uh, of computing the entropy of the black hole as seen from the outside, uh, but really he was sort of looking at in the sort of 
near the black hole region. And what I will talk about is the, what happens uh, on the inside of the black hole by looking even farther away from the black hole. Okay, it's going to be clear in a second. Um, so um, let me first redraw the picture that Juan just erased. Um, the idea, so, that, so what Juan showed is that if you were to, were to try to compute the entropy as sort of viewed from a point uh, there, just, just outside the black hole, then, and, you, and if you apply the formula S black hole is equal to the minimization, uh, extremization of area of a surface, let me call it X, or 4G Newton, plus S, um, I'm going to call it S bulk, for S matter, of the region sigma X, where the region sigma X, where X is some point here, um, and this is sigma X. Then applying this formula gives you, it gives you the page curve for uh, the black hole. It's something that looks like this. Um, but now you can ask what would happen? Uh, well, if one, we expect to get the same answer, if we were to compute the entropy of the, rem the remainder of the space time, which, is, which you can think of as the entropy of the Hawking radiation that escapes the black hole. If you assume unitarity, you can deduce what the formula for the entropy is going to be. But prior to doing that, we know from Hawking's calculation that we just have all this Hawking radiation going out, which, which is entangled with the interior Hawking modes, and therefore the entropy of the Hawking radiation would just continue to increase and saturate at some large value. Uh, but if you assume unitarity, you know that you also have to include this region when you compute the entropy of the black hole, uh, sorry, of the radiation. So SR, the radiation, uh, is going to be the same formula, but I'm going to write it in a slightly different way using slightly different quantities. Well, it's going to be the same uh, area of the same uh, surface X divided by 4G Newton plus S bulk of the complement of sigma x. So this is going to be, um, let me call this region R, this is where the radiation is, and let me call this region I. So it's R union I. Um, let me relabel x as the boundary of I. Okay, so the idea now is that when we compute the entropy of the radiation, we should include uh, uh, contributions coming from possible uh, regions inside the black hole, which we call islands. Regions that are sort of uh, far away from the, uh, the region that you might naively associate with, associate with the radiation. Okay, so you, you include possible co contributions from these regions. Okay, and um, the question now is whether one can justify this formula in a, in a more rigorous way uh, other than just assuming the answer and saying that these two things have to be the same. Okay, so that's what this talk is going to be about. Oh, and something else. Uh, um, I will show how this formula, uh, it, uh, it really has some, some really to me, astonishing features. It, it, it sort of um, seems to say that semi-classical gravity, well, to me, knows a lot more than it ought to know. Okay? And I'll give you examples of that. Uh, the, one of which is the page curve. Let me consider, uh, the kind of black hole I'm going to consider is, um, is an eternal black hole, but one that is eternally coupled, uh, sorry, it's an eternal black hole in ADS that is eternally coupled to an external uh, system. Okay, Basil, is there a question? Yes. Yeah. So is there any intuition for when X should be inside or outside the Um 
Um, and the example I'm, I'm going to give you, it's a bit outside. Uh, I don't have a good answer to that currently. Um, it seems like it's mostly going to be inside, but in some spe special situations, it's going to be outside. Okay. Um, so the case I'm going to consider, again, is um, an eternal black hole uh, inside of ADS. I'm mostly going to work in 1 plus 1 dimensions. Um, I'm imagining that, uh, uh, so here I have some gravity theory, maybe a JT gravity coupled to some conformal matter, conformal just for convenience. And I imagine that for the conformal matter, I've imposed transparent boundary conditions at the asymptotic boundary. Therefore, the energy can sort of flow in and out. Okay. Um, here I've, in, I've introduced two uh, flat space regions. So flat space um, bath regions, that's, that's what I'm going to call it, um, which is initialized in some uh, state where I have um, radiation coming in, balancing out the Hawking radiation going out. Okay? You should think of this as a toy model for an eternal black hole in higher dimensions. Okay? Um, all right. And the claim is that this eternal black hole uh, just, uh, um, yeah, this eternal black hole uh, has an information paradox. Okay? And the claim is that that information paradox also applies even for regular Schwarzschild black holes in higher dimensions. So what is this information paradox here? Uh, we're used to information paradoxes when the black hole evaporates away completely. But let me explain it here. So suppose we compute the entropy of a region which is outside the black hole in this way. Um, actually, before I, before I do that, before I consider this, um, let me just make a comment that um, the state of the radiation on this background is prepared by the following, the following Euclidean path integral. Where in this region here, I have just Euclidean uh, flat space uh, CFT. And in this region, now I'm specializing to one plus one dimensions, I have Euclidean ADS2 uh, plus CFT. Okay? So I'm just doing the usual sort of hartle hawking prescription, but uh, where I'm evaluating the field theory path integral on a fixed background. Um, this continues in Lorentzian time to the picture that I have on the left. Okay. The state that is prepared here at t equals zero is I'm going to call zero tilde state. Um, maybe tilde is not important. I know. Um, the claim is that this, this, uh, this state is analogous to the hartle hawking state, and it has the usual entanglement that you expect in a black hole background. For example, you have Hawking radiation entangled across the horizon and uh, radiation going in and out and so on. Um, now let's talk about the computation of the entropy. Okay, so this region here, let's call it R, the union of this region and this region. And it's not hard to see that as a function of time, the entropy of R is simply going to increase uh, linearly uh, with time for all time. Uh, the reason being is that as a function of time, uh, this region continues to collect more and more Hawking modes that are entangled with the Hawking modes uh, inside the black hole. Okay? And this black hole, the rate at which these modes are captured is controlled by the temperature of the black hole. And this black hole uh, is eternal, the temperature is constant. And so you just keep collecting these modes uh, at a fixed rate for all time. So this rate goes as um, uh, the temperature times time, also times C, which is a central charge of the matter theory that we have in the bulk. OK. Um, but this is uh, uh, a paradox 
because this black hole has a finite coarse grained entropy as uh, Juan uh, discussed. So its coarse grained entropy uh, not only is finite, but it's constant. It's given by twice the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Looks like it's changing, but it's not really changing. Okay, uh, twice because uh, it's a wormhole, it has two horizons. You can think of it like that. And um, after this time here, which is the page time, you, how you end up with a situation where the amount of entanglement is much larger, well, well is larger than what the black hole has room for. So that's, that's the paradox. Um, and if you believe in unitarity, um, what, page would, what page would tell you is that the expected curve would grow with the Hawking answer, which is this guy, and then it would saturate to this constant value at play times after the page time. Any questions about that? Okay, so now, um, so this is the paradox. Now we can just apply this formula and see how, um, how our conclusions uh, can be changed. And um, what, you, what, what you find ultimately is that at late times, um, there is another, well, there's an island contribution that extremizes this functional, which uh, goes, which threads the, the wormhole, uh, starts at some location outside, but near the horizon, and ends uh, at the analogous place, analogous place on the other side. And now, uh, and if you compute the entropy evaluated with this island, you indeed find that it's more or less constant uh, for all time. And the, um, we can understand why the entropy is small for this contribution is because when you compute the entropy of R, you also include all of the interior Hawking modes that purify the exterior Hawking modes. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Um, all right. The next thing I'm, I'm going to talk about is um, the hayden Presco protocol and how this formula gives us a bulk interpretation uh, of it. So next is hayden Presco. So what do hayden Presco say? They say that if you have a um, black hole, say represented, well, me, represented by a, well, they say if you, if you consider a quantum system represented by a bunch of qubits that is maximally entangled with another set of qubits, like that, um, then um, if you, so let, let's call these qubits B for black hole and let's call these qubits R for radiation. If you were to insert a message or include a message with the black hole, let's call some state psi, and then act with a random unitary, okay, we can talk about how random this unitary needs to be in a, in a, in a bit. So you've scrambled this information uh, with the black hole degrees of freedom. And then you, took, um, then you took some of the bits of the black hole and you included them with the radiation. You can decode the state psi from the radiation. Okay. So that, this, is, this is the hayden Prescott protocol. And um, so the statement in, the, in this picture would be that if I throw information into this black hole and then I collect some Hawking radiation, I should be able to see that this information is now inside or contained in the Hawking radiation. Um, now there's a question of 
how random does this scrambling or, or this unitary need to be? And the statement is that it's, it's um, uh, well, if it's uh, um, given sort of some physical constraints into sort of the dynamics of how systems evolve, um, you should, well, let me just say what the statement is. They say if you consider what is called a scrambling circuit, where, um, which is given by a, a circuit where the, you couple the different qubits, uh, you couple an order one number of qubits together at every step, but you um, allow for all possible couplings. For example, let's say you have two to two couplings. So at the first stage, you couple these two, these two, these two, or you act with these simple unitaries. And then at the second stage, you couple this guy to this guy, and this guy to this guy, and so on. So, that's a, so it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's composed at each step of, a, of, a, of coupling a small number of qubits together at every, at every step. Um, the question uh, is then, how many steps do you need to, to go through such that this, um, this process is uh, such, such that the, the decoding of the state psi is successful. And the statement is that the number of steps um, sufficient for this is uh, log n, where n is the number of qubits of the black hole. So here, this is n. Okay. Um, such, a, uh, su such a quantum circuit is called a scrambling circuit. Okay. Now, in this picture, um, you can ask the same question. Uh, let me draw it again. Oops. Let's say, um, uh, even though the island doesn't actually exist at t equals zero, but I'm going to draw it anyways. I'm going to draw two cases. So if I throw some information here at t equals zero, uh, let's say in the, on the left-hand side, I threw, an inf I, I threw some information into the black hole. At t equals zero, this information is, not, is, is part of the black hole degrees of freedom. But at some later time, this information is going to be inside the island. And therefore, it's going to be inside or contained in the radiation, if you believe in entanglement, entanglement wedge reconstruction, as uh, Douglas uh, uh, described earlier today. Um, the time, it turns out that if you throw this information, the time you need to wait for this message to be contained in the island is precisely this time scale which is which which in the, the black hole context is uh, beta times log of the entropy of the black hole. Well, for for some reason, for these black holes, it's actually you have to subtract the ground state uh, entropy. Okay, and so this picture and this formula reproduces this uh, scrambling time uh, notion, which was sort of anticipated by these uh, considerations. Yeah, and um, uh, yes. I, I guess I can ask you a similar question. So, Hayden Prescott was talking about observers on Scry. They will tell you about observers that collect the Hawking radiation. Well, they could be on. They, they, they could be on Scry. So, don't we need some kind of math from the island time to the time on on Scry? Um, um, it's not the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, it, they certainly weren't talking about the proper time of the thing that comes from here. Sure. Um, I don't know how to define this notion for intervals on scry. Um, what I, the way that I've defined it is just by how much time do I need to wait in, in, in this time? Um, uh, 
such that the information appears in the, in the radiation. I agree that if I do it on scry, then it's, I guess, there might be an analogous story where instead of considering intervals like that, I instead consider intervals like this. And I keep, I keep increasing the, I, I, I sort of increase this, uh, this interval and I, and I collect more and more Hawking radiation. Um, and I guess you want to ask the relation between um, the relation between this time and how the island moves. Um, I haven't I haven't really thought about that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, an order one number. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's a sum of order one number. Of, uh, it's, it's a sum of terms. Each term couples an order one number, but each each qubit gets each qubit is uh, participates in some interaction. For example, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Okay, uh, the last thing uh, will be to derive the island formula. Okay, so I'm gonna erase this now. Okay. Um, okay, so to derive the island formula, we need to first um, consider the full path integral that prepares uh, this uh, state, which is, now I'm going to draw it as a square instead of a circle. Um, in this region here, I have JT plus CFT, and the outside region, I just have CFT. Um, here, the path integral that I did was just the CFT path integral on a fixed background. But here, I'm thinking of the full path integral, including the, gra the gravitational path integral in, in, inside the JT region. And to compute the, we compute the entropy using the replica trick. Um, which says that the von Neumann entropy of, a, of rho is minus partial n trace rho to the n. And the key quantity here to compute is trace rho to the n, which is some path integral uh, on some replicated manifold. Okay. Um, I'm going to consider a few examples. The first example to consider is the single interval case. This is going to justify the formula uh, that uh, Juan was working with. So the way you do this, you first consider the replicated manifold. which uh, is composed of these n sheets identified across uh, some cut uh, where the cut is the region you want to compute the entropy of. Um, I'm first going to consider computing the entropy of a region like that. So it starts at some point uh, in the CFT region B and ends on the ADS boundary. Okay. So a region like this, oh, I drew it there. Let me draw a cut. Right, so this, um, uh, again, these sheets are identified across the cut. Here, uh, I should emphasize that um, I'm still setting up the problem. I have not uh, filled in the gravity configurations in the, in the, in the gravitational part yet. And that's gonna happen in a bit. Um, 
Before doing that, it's convenient to work in what is called a cover, where you do the appropriate coordinate transformation to remove the branch cut. Okay? So now there's no branch cut. The length of this circle is uh, n times beta. Here it was, uh, well, without any cuts, it was just beta. Um, and and, uh, and um, for this setup here, we know how to solve sort of JT gravity in this, in, in this case. And we know that what, all we do is we simply fill in this disk with a hyperbolic disk. That's the, that's, that's the simplest contribution to, to this path integral. Obviously, one can have higher topology uh, configurations, but let's just consider the simplest one. That turns out to be the dominant one. And then we can choose to um, sort of, uh, uh, um, so when, going from here to here, we, what we did is that we sort of unwound this, this setup, but now let's wind it back. And working with more physical coordinates, what you find is that the original branch cut outside, it gets extended into the bulk in this fashion. This point here is B. This new point in the bulk is some location A. And um, from the arguments that one mentioned, uh, you evaluate the, um, the off-shell action and you find um, uh, what, what the thing that fixes the location of A uh, is going to be the equations of motion. Um, and so from here you find that the entropy, the, yeah, the entropy of, of this region becomes, um, I guess I can, I'll write it up here. So this region here, let's call it B. So you find that the entropy of B is equal to the, um, uh, what you find is gonna be the area, actually, which in this case is the dilaton because then we're in one plus one dimensions, so you can write that as phi at A divided by four G Newton, plus the bulk entropy of the region um, from A to B. Okay. And uh, yeah, again, uh, the, equations, the equations of motion imply the extremality condition. Okay, and uh, yeah. I'll, I'll discuss the minimality in a second. Okay, so this was this is sort of the, the derivation of uh, of this formula that talk, that um, Juan was using. Next uh, is going to be the two interval case, which uh, which addresses this 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 problem. So again, we consider the uh, replicated manifold this way. You put the cuts outside, okay, and so on. And we uh, look for um, well, we have to we have to evaluate the full gravity path integral subject to whatever boundary conditions are are on the circle. And uh, two relevant contributions come from two uh, possible saddles. One, which I will call the semi-classical saddle. Where um, if I work uh, sort of on, on this branched cover, it looks like this. where the, it, it, for, so for the saddle, the gravity region is simply filled in with hyperbolic space. Um, this contribution ultimately gives uh, the, um, the answer as predicted by Hawking, or by, um, the, the answer as uh, sort of consistent with Hawking's analysis, that the entropy simply grows. And there's another saddle, which we can call the wormhole saddle where the different uh, um, uh, sheets or the different replicas 
uh, are covered by, are connected by wormholes. Okay, so let me, let me draw an example for the case of n equals 3. Something that looks like this. And if you work uh, on the branched cover, it looks like this. These wormholes connecting the different sheets can be represented by a new pair of branch points and a branch cut in the gravity region. Okay. So one contribution looks like this, another contribution looks like this. And it's not hard to see how such a configuration would give us the answer that we wanted. Okay. If you work near n equals 1, um, um, from, from these cuts, so this was the cut which, was, which I called R, this cut here, let's call it I, we know that the entropy of R, um, because of the existence of this cut, contains a piece which is the, which is the entropy as bulk, let's call it, of the region R union I. And from the branch points in the gravity region, we get the area or the diloton evaluated on the boundary of I. Okay. And again, um, uh, the, from, the equations, from the equations of motion, you find that, that the thing that fixes the location or the size of the island, ultimately it's going, uh, it comes from the equations of motion, uh, which gives you this extremality condition. And um, yeah, so the point here, just one, one last point about this before I take questions on this, is that we have two uh, possible saddles to computing trace rho to the n. So this is trace rho r to the n. There's one which is e to the minus n minus one, um, uh, s uh, semi-classical. Uh, plus e to the n minus one times s wormhole or you can call it island. And the idea is that there's a, so there's a competition between these two saddles. We know from the, um, the, the page curve that I drew earlier, the semi-classical saddle simply increases, uh, gives, it gives an entropy which just keeps growing for all time, while the, um, the, the, the correction from the island gives you something which is constant. And so you can see what happens here is that the, um, the contribution from the saddle decreases as a function of time. Okay? Both of these are very tiny uh, sort of quantities to, the, to, to this observable trace row to the end. Um, but um, um, but at, at late times, uh, this thing becomes uh, much more subdominant compared to this. We have a first order phase transition between these two um, saddle points. Um, any questions about that? Okay, the final thing I was gonna say is about, is one more case, which is I think is a, it's a simple and very interesting case. It's where you compute the entropy of the entire uh, bath region, including the boundary of ADS. Uh, I guess I just erased this, but let me try it again. So what if you compute the entropy of this entire region? Okay. In the black hole space-time, that's not computing the entropy of this region. Okay. 
Um, there's a sort of, um, well, first let me tell you the answer and then tell you how to, uh, how to see that, it, that we should have expected this. So again, let's, let's do the, re the replica trick. So we draw multiple copies. Identified across these cuts, and so on. And so we, we have not filled in the gravity configuration yet. So these are now just hollow disks. But if, so if I go through this cut here, I come out there. If I go through the cut here, I come out there. This means that there's a very simple rearrangement of these uh, cuts such that I join uh, this top guy to this bottom guy and then this top guy to the bottom guy of the next and so on. So th this thing just becomes this thing to the power of n. Okay? So, so, so it, it completely factorizes. And now I can fill in the gravitational the most naive gravitational saddle, which is simply the hyperbolic space here. Um, this is just one to the power of n, which by some magic is equal to one. And um, which implies that the entropy, which is the n trace row to the n, is zero. So this replica calculation um, uh, tells you that the entropy of the entire bath along with this, with the endpoint here, is equal to zero. Okay. This, this is something that you would have concluded from sort of ADS CFT considerations. You could have said, oh, I can, just repl I can replace this ADS region, or, or rather, I can describe this system using just the, um, the boundary quantum mechanical systems. So this you can think of as it's a, it's some so I have two SYKs, if you will, living on these boundaries, which are coupled to two um, half space uh, field theories or half space spin chains or wh wh whatever you want to call it. And so it's not, it's, and that's all you have. And it's, it's clearly true that the entropy of this entire thing, including these two points, has to be zero because it's a global pure state. And I find it amazing that just gravity was, it was sort of able to deduce that without us having to tell gravity that there is a putative boundary uh, dual. So somehow the, the, the path integral knows, already knows something about uh, holography. And that is all I had to say. Thanks. Yes. Is it fair to say that because of the inclusion of this island in any assessment of information, the black hole complementarity survives and there's no firewall? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so it, it, seems to, it seems to suggest that. Okay? Um, so um, maybe I, I can draw what's right here. So this black hole also has, an, has a firewall paradox because if you're after the page time, you're somewhere here, the entropy should not grow. But then that means that the next Hawking mode to come out should not increase the entropy. But this Hawking mode is entangled with its partner Hawking mode behind the horizon. So therefore, it seems like the entropy will grow. You can run the, 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 the firewall argument and say, oh, um, well, in order for the entropy not to grow, just break this entanglement. You break this entanglement here, you create a firewall. There's a problem in this particular setup with, if, if you have a firewall at any point, um, it turns out that you have a firewall everywhere because this black hole has a boost symmetry. And so, and the resolution would be in this case, that you have, because of the island, this interior mode is actually part of the radiation. So there's no, um, there's no inconsistency with the entropy staying constant. And the, and the interpretation you would attach to this is maybe something like ER equals EPR. 
that the inside is now part of the uh, radiation. I guess that was shown by the pets map business and so on. May I make another comment about that? So uh, I think that, so I'm sure the paradox that was present when you assume black hole complementarity, and I think the, the way they described black hole complementarity, which I think is how people understood it, was that the interior was described by the quantum system that was describing the black hole from the outside. Quantum system that appears in the central dogma was supposed to also describe the interior in some non-committing way. I think that was the idea of complementarity. And that idea, Armstrong was wrong and continues to be wrong. And the resolution is uh, that the island is part of the radiation, as I just say. So um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's uh, perhaps. Yeah. Not recovering complementarity, and unless now you want to say, oh well, what they really meant by complementarity is that uh, the interior was actually part of the radiation. Um, well, if you ask Lenny, probably that's what you said. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's not what AMPS uh, set out to say. Mm, I see, I see. Never, sure, sure. Uh, yes, yes. Never say that they were considered in that case. Exactly. So, is it correct to say that? When I have a theory with dynamical gravity, wherever gravity is dynamical, I don't get to choose which region I'm calculating the entropy of. So the fine grain entropy of this thing gets like which region that includes determined dynamically and includes that island. But in which sense is that plus the exterior the entropy of the radiation? So so I think the first point that you made, I think that's that's true in general, like even without these considerations, that when you if you want to compute the uh, entropy of a subregion in a theory of gravity, you need to be careful about what you mean by that subregion. Because it's, uh, because if you do diffeomorphism invariance and so on, it's not clear what you mean by that region. Here we got around that by having this flat space field theory outside where we can, where uh, it's well defined to, to, pick, to pick a region. And now the lesson is that, yes, if you have dynamical gravity, what you mean by that region, uh, it changes not, not in that the definition that you chose is incorrect, but that you can have these new, new island, you, have the, you can have these island contributions. Um, um, I don't know if that fully addressed your question. But the entropy that I'm computing at the end, ah. not the entropy of that region, it's the entropy that's not the island, right? No, 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 good, 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 good. So, so I, I actually wanted to comment on this at the beginning, but I didn't get a chance, or I forgot. So here the statement is that the entropy of R, or rather, the entropy of the density matrix of the region R is equal to whatever the area of the, of the boundary of the island, plus it was the entropy of the, of the density matrix of R union I. Right? There's something weird about this formula. In that R, the, the density matrix of R appears on both sides, right? If you trace I, you get rho R. But the statement is that um, this, the thing that appears on the left here is, you should think of this as trying to, we're trying to compute the exact entropy of R. And we have found a prescription that captures the entropy of R, but by working in the semi-classical limit. So this density matrix really should have a tilde here. It's the density matrix of the state that is prepared via the, um, the path integral with a fixed geometry. Okay? And uh, so the, the, even though I didn't give you a prescription for computing the density matrix exactly, I just computed the entropy. But, this, but, uh, but yeah, but this entropy computation has been re-expressed in terms of this new prescription prescription that is, that is applicable in the semi-classical limit. Um, yes? So is it fair to say that rho r on the left-hand side can be traced against any CFT operator you want, but rho tilde on the right-hand side cannot be traced against any CFT operator? For example, yes. an operator that yes. 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 Like yes. yes. So it simply acts on a different space? Um, it allows, it, it allows you to compute observables of a larger algebra. The left-hand side. The left-hand side. 
the rho, the rho r here. So, I mean, even though we don't believe, so the following thing I'm going to write down, we don't quite believe that it's true in the case, in the particular case that I'm considering with JT gravity plus CFT. But in a more realistic theory, so the idea is that rho r is computed via the following path integral. So let's say this is the matrix elements A, A prime. So where I put sort of the state A above the cut and A prime below the cut. And I'm just fully, I'm evaluating the full path integral everywhere, okay? Um, including all possible geometries here and so on and strings and whatever you want. Um, um, and if, you, if I just put the hyper hyperbolic space here, I would get rho tilde r. Yeah? So this is maybe just a terminology question. This n equals 3 saddle that you've written down is a Z3 symmetry permuting the replicas. So in what sense is it a replica symmetry breaking? It's not, nothing, again, uh, in my talk and in Juan's talk, nothing was replica symmetry breaking. We were assuming replica symmetry for everything we did. Okay, so when I see people using those words for that saddle, I should read into it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, I, I think no, nobody uses those saddle. words. No, nobody uses replica symmetry breaking. <laughs> no, no, sorry, oh, 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 I see. It's not the, so, it's just whether you have replica symmetric configurations or replica non-symmetric repli <laughs> configurations. We never talk about the latter, but the Stanford group do consider them. Okay. Yeah. They're not very important except right at the transition between the two different replica symmetric saddle points that compute the two sides of the page curve. Mm -hmm. You only need to care about those other kinds of geometries to explain the transition. Right. So you can use RT in those geometries. You can't use just the RT formula. Yes? So you have these two competing saddle points in the, the wormhole saddle, even when it's not, even when it doesn't give the one on the entropy, it has an interpretation of a thermodynamic entropy. Um, uh, does the semi classical saddle that gives the Hawking calculation, does that have an interpretation as any kind of thermodynamic entropy? Or? The Hawking saddle, sorry? Uh, the, so the semi classical saddle that gives you Hawking's yeah, yeah. calculation. Yeah. Yeah. It is the thermodynamic entropy of the radiation. It's, because it's large, it's it, it it's a very large cloud, and that's why the entropy is is well, yeah. I don't know if I want to make that general of a statement. Um, um, I mean, for example, this, this wormhole saddle, it, um, let me see, it actually, there, so let's say the, th the thermodynamic entropy of a black hole is this flat, is this straight line. The wormhole saddle for some particular cases, it actually, uh, it, it's, I think larger, it starts out larger than it and then approaches it. I guess at this time, at early times, it really doesn't doesn't have any interpretation as a as a as a, as a thermal entropy. So I guess the, in general, no. There are no other questions. I think Ahmed again.